Welcome back, Calc BC students. We're going to take a look at our example two from topic 1011. We're still in the midst of learning about these new models to approximate actual functions. We're going to officially introduce the Taylor polynomial. So if you remember from video number one, we actually found both a linear model and a quadratic model that served to sort of mimic the function at hand. In our example, it was natural log of x. But now the big question is, hey, can we extend this idea and maybe find higher degree polynomials like third power, fourth power, fifth power? And the answer is a resounding yes, because that's what the whole point of this investigation is about. So I've got here on the screen, um, maybe you can follow along with me here as I kind of outline this, but we remember that p1 and p2 had these two forms. Though it's only logical then that P3, a third degree polynomial, would look something like this perhaps, right? The only thing is we're going to have to find this value of B. And if you recall, we actually did find the value of A uh, in this particular case. We had, had discovered earlier that it was actually going to be um, a certain constant. We're going to get back to that here in a bit. So it remains important to make sure that we satisfy the, the, the same conditions. Now the third uh, polynomial has to match the function. The first derivative of the third polynomial has to match the function's first derivative. Second derivatives have to match. Third derivatives have to match. Otherwise, we can't really use it as a fairly reliable model. So because P3 is built using P2, it turns out that these three conditions, yep, the three that I am going to highlight right now, those are already met. Now, the reason being is that we've already shown those are met for P2. There's no point of expanding it. But we don't know if the third condition is the third derivative of the polynomial matching the third derivative of the function. So what we're going to have to do is take that third derivative. Okay, well, let's do that won't be too tough. So let's kind of pick up where we left off here. I'm going to star this. This is the third degree polynomial that we're looking to obtain. So then we take its first derivative. So remember, the f of c actually goes away because that's a constant. The derivative of this term, f prime of c constant, derivative of x minus c is 1. So there's the first term. Derivative of this guy that I'm circling 2a quantity x minus c to the first, and the derivative of this guy that I'm boxing, 3b x minus c to the second. Okay, from there we take another derivative, he drops out, 2a, 3b times 2, which is 3 times 2b, x minus c to the first, got it. Let's take a third derivative, 2a drops out, and here we get 3 times 2 times b, which is the constant which is the same as 3 factorial. Hmm. Yeah, 3 times 2, 3 times 2 times 1. It's all 3 factorial, OK? So now we know that p sub 3, third derivative, is 3 times 2 times b. If we evaluate that at c, we still get 3 factorial times b, because there's no x to replace with c. And we know that that still has to be equivalent to the third derivative of f. So that means the b, when we solve for it, is the third derivative evaluated at c divided by 3 factorial. Now we're on to something. If you remember back, we said that a was 1 over 2, b is 1 over 3 factorial, and of course multiplied by f triple primacy. This one was also multiplied by f double primacy. And if you really look down deep, you could put a factorial on that too. Shh, don't tell anybody, but you can, because 2 is the same as 2 factorial. And now something magical happens. So you ready for the magic? I'm ready for the magic. The magic is about to happen because, boom, this is it. With these coefficients, we can obtain the following definition of Taylor polynomials, named after the English mathematician Brooke Taylor and Maclaurin polynomials, named after the English mathematician Colin Maclaurin. And so here is your definition. Now notice P sub n, that would be the polynomial of any nth degree, 
which is the same as any nth derivative that we might take, starts off as we had before, f of c plus f prime of c, x minus c. There's our linear. Toss in our quadratic. Yep, I put that 2 factorial there, didn't I? And you just keep that pattern going. And if you haven't figured it out, the pattern is the nth derivative of c over the nth factorial x minus c to the n. And you can go up as high as you want to go, right? If you want to get really crazy, check this out. Technically, technically, this is over 1 factorial raised to the first. What? Technically, this is over 0 factorial, which is 1 times x minus c to the 0. What? Those are all there. So you've got this very locked-in pattern that's going to make our job easy. Now, if you're wondering, what's the difference between a Taylor and a Maclaurin polynomial? Well, one of them's named after Taylor. The other one's named after Maclaurin. Oh, there must be more to it than that. Okay. The Taylor polynomial is centered at some value c, but the Maclaurin polynomial is very specifically centered at zero. It seems kind of silly that there's another name for one that's centered at zero. There just is. But if you ever called a polynomial centered at zero a Taylor, it's technically OK. C can be anything in a Taylor. But for the Maclaurin, it's only centered at zero. And I've got a little bio there for Brooke Taylor, English mathematician, best known for his contributions to the study of the infinite series. He didn't live to be very old, as you can see. Uh, looks like he passed away in his mid-40s. Uh, but he did make a lot of contributions to the world of mathematics. And um, he is the man who first developed integration by parts, which is a fun known fact. So there we go. And I guess what's really left to do is finally our example two. We're seven minutes in and we can actually start example two. So this is the type of problem that you're going to see a lot uh, heading this on, heading this way forth and, and, and not just stopping with this topic, but as we move into say topic 1014, which is you know, a few days away here still, you're going to be doing the same process. The process is a little bit cumbersome, but it's easy. Find the seventh degree Maclaurin polynomial P7 of x for the function sine of x. And sine of x is a great one to do this for because it's one of those things that we couldn't use to compute values for x without probably a calculator. So what you're going to start with is you're going to start with the function f of x equals sine. Seems silly to write something that's already on your page, but it kind of organizes things. Now what you want to do is to take a lot of derivatives. We want a seventh degree Maclaurin. So we'll go ahead and, and maybe right now equate seventh degree with seventh derivative because they, they are seemingly tied together. And the reason is because the, the, the constant term is the zeroth derivative. The first degree linear term is actually used uh, is developed by using the first derivative. So we'll take seven derivatives. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it'll go pretty fast. Derivative of sine is cosine. Second derivative is negative sine. Third derivative is negative cosine. By the time you get to the fourth derivative, you use a slightly different notation. Otherwise, we're going to be here counting tick marks all day long. So we're back to positive sine. So it's just a little bit of a cycle here. It's not very often that you're going to go this deep. There's a special reason why I'm having us take so many derivatives, why I'm having us find a seventh degree polynomial, because this is a kind of a special function. After that, you are going to take each one of these functions and evaluate them at zero. So I'm just going to set the stage. f of zero, f prime of zero, f double prime, f triple prime, etc. I promise this will be really cool. Stay with me.
equal, 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 equal. So here we go. If I'm, you're finding that you're kind of falling behind the video, just pause and catch up. So f of 0 is the sine of 0. Well, that's 0. f prime is 0. Cosine of 0, that's 1. Anytime we see sine, the answer is going to be 0. Anytime we see cosine, the answer is going to be 1, but you have to watch out if it's negative or positive. So bam, look how fast we can fill that out. Now. The only thing that's left to do is to write our answer. Are you ready? Remember our good friend. This is a Maclaurin polynomial. So we could actually use this form because we are centered at 0. You start off with f of 0, but f of 0 is 0. Nothing really to put, right? OK, well, that's interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and get things started here. P7 of x is, so let's go to the next term, which, uh, whoops, sorry, I'm bouncing all over the place. It says f prime of 0 of times x, f prime of 0 times x. Well, that would be 1 times x. There's our first term. Notice the f double prime term is going to have a 0. So we're going to go to the f triple prime term, which we don't see here because it's kind of like hidden in this dot, dot, dot. But it's just f triple prime of 0 divided by 3 factorial times x to the third. So that's going to be our pattern. We're going to subtract because this guy's negative. We're going to use him over 3 factorial times x to the third. If we get to the fourth term, he's going to have a 0 in front, which wipes everything out. We get to the fifth term, which is 1 over positive 1, that is, over, yep, you guessed it, 5 factorial times x to the fifth. There is no sixth term. We get to the seventh term, minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the seventh. And that is our seventh degree polynomial. This is going to be very similarly behaved to the sine of x. How similar, you ask? I'm, I'm glad you asked. Well, that's what part b is about. Let's use p of 7 of x to approximate the sine of point 2. All right, so we're going to say that the sine of 0 0.2 is approximately p7 of 0 0.2 which in this case would be, and I know this is going to seem silly and you're not going to like me doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway for the purpose of this video. I don't think that you would necessarily have to write this out all the time on your paper because you can use a calculator. But I'm going to replace every one of those x's that I have up there in that polynomial that I just wrote with 0 0.2. And I'm kind of cleaning it up, as you can see, as well. So this is what I want to type in to my calculator. So let's do it. So boom, here we are. I took the liberty of going ahead and storing this polynomial P of X, right? That is the seventh degree polynomial that we just discovered. Oops, no, it's not. Be nice if I could type the polynomial incorrectly. Just making sure you're paying attention. <laughs> Gosh. That's supposed to be a 3. There we go. I like that one better. Let's for, forget you ever saw that. So there is our 7th degree polynomial, as we had it written before. Now, what I'm going to do is evaluate this at 0 0.2, just for kicks. Let's see what we get. 0 0.1986, 0 0.1986, or 1987 if you round. Well, the question that we wanted to ask is, how close is that to the sine of 0 0.2, right? And I don't mean to shout. We can just say sine. The sine of 0 0.2. Wow. It's the same all the way through to the fifth decimal place. Now, this has me intrigued. I'm going to go up to this guy. I'm going to get me some more decimal points. And I'm going to go up to maybe this guy, 
and I'm going to get me some more decimal points. And now I'm going to compare them, and I'm going to see they change right, right there, right there. I don't even want to count how many digits that is. I don't even want to pronounce that. What is it, like the, 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 the hundred trillionth or something? I don't know. But you, you guys, in all seriousness, this is pretty amazing because the founding fathers of calculus, if they needed to compute what is the sign of point 0.2, they could have done this very easily. In fact, we just did it. Now, granted, they didn't probably use their calculator to find this p of 0.2, but you could take 0.2 and, and raise it to the third or the fifth or the seventh if you were motivated enough to do so and did all the work by hand. And without ever touching a calculator, it's amazing the degree of accuracy. Let's go ahead and write this up in our description on our problem and look at the last part. So if you remember, our p7 was 0 0.1986. And I'll just stop at four decimal places and I'll truncate. Now, there is one other question here. It says, what do you notice about the degree of each term of the seventh degree polynomial? Okay, well, I'm going to look. He asked. Uh, let's see here. If I go to the polynomial, I notice that this is a first degree. That's a third, a fifth, and a seventh. Well, if I had to go out on a limb here, I would say they are odd. And that's exactly true. They're odd. What kind of assumption do you think you might make about the Maclaurin polynomial for cosine of x? And I'm actually not going to answer that question. I want you to make that conjecture and think about it, and it's very likely that you'll probably be working with cosine of x in the not-so-distant future. Now, before we go, I have one more thing I want to wow you with. We're going to go back to the graphing calculator, and we're going to close the video out. So here we are. I've already had my p of x defined. I'm going to switch over to a graphing scratch pad, and I'm going to see, can I graph my f1 of x as p? Oh, looks good so far. Anytime it's bold means it's understood by the calculator. And here is the graph of p of x. OK, that's my seventh degree polynomial. All right, I'm going to go ahead and graph the sine of x, just for the heck of it, in red. That's what he looks like. And I think I might just really quickly take this guy and I might change this to like pi over 4 or something that makes a little bit more sense just so that we have a better idea of what's happening. And I could change this right endpoint to something if I wanted to like pi. And uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, let's change that to 2 pi. 2 pi is better. It's going to switch to a decimal. That's fine. That's fine for the purpose of what I'm trying to do here. Now, I like this window a little bit better. In fact, I'm going to even go better still. Change this to 2. Change this to negative 2. You see that our sine curve in red seems to be very closely matched by this 7th degree polynomial in blue. In fact, there's a lot of reliability, say, between maybe right around here all the way through to right here. In fact, <laughs> dead set in the middle, they're spot on. At 0 0.2, which if you recall was our value that we approximated it at, that would be pretty close here to the origin, maybe right around in this region, we had a very good approximation. That's going to happen. The closer you are to that middle, the better the approximation. The bigger the power, the farther away you can move from that middle. And that's how we're going to be working with these Taylor polynomials. And we're going to do so much more with them. I know the video was long. The first two of this uh, um, uh, lesson are very, very, very important. Not going to be quite as long moving forward. A lot of good practice. If you like what you see, please subscribe and please stick around. Just getting started. We'll see you next time.